This is the Creeks Cast. Good morning, afternoon, evening, Creeks Cast fans. It's your boy, Lachlan Cody, and a new guest who will be introduced later on in the episode for Creeks Cast episode number 141. We've actually got breaking news to talk about, actual Canucks content to talk about. But first, the main piece of news that you guys are going to want to hear. Big news out of Bakersfield. Former Vancouver Canuck, legend of the game, Tim Schaller, has signed an AHL contract with the Bakersfield Condors. No this way. This is huge. <laughs> this is massive. Uh, I think there were some other contracts that were signed, but today's a big day for Canuck sports fans worldwide. This is why you guys are tuning in to hear the important shit getting broken down. Um, Lachlan, like just your thoughts on the Schaller's impact to the game, his, his, his legacy for you, his legacy. Well, I think it's pretty clear that in Vancouver, uh, Tim Schaller's legacy is entirely based on a, I believe it was a steak. Was it a steak bet or was it a gum bet? I forget what Drancer and I, J Pat did at the time. I forget. I forget if they've had multiple bets or not over the last two seasons. Cause let's be honest, the last two seasons kind of blend together <laughs> a little bit in like, at least the regular seasons do the playoff bubble feels like its own, just separate little entity that kind of just happened mm-hmm. in the alternate universe while the other two seasons just kind of like mold, like molded together. Um, yeah, like t- Tim Schaller had 59 games played as recently as like within the last two years and like it feels like a decade ago he played for the team that's wild because they traded him to la in the tyler to fully trade did they not he went yeah with the, correct that's wild <laughs> that feels I know, but it seems like that feels ages ago ages he ago holy cow we yeah. have all we have all grown so much since then uh sometimes for the better sometimes for the worse yeah. but uh like our show which like has grown show. by one member today that's true. You can't hear him, I don't think. Maybe you can hear him on your end. But uh, Lachlan, why don't you introduce? Yeah, why the don't new we, member of the team? Why don't we introduce uh, a new a new member? We have a new member of the team. Uh, we have a we actually got decided we needed to go out and uh, we needed a producer for the show uh, to help an kind intern. of yeah an, an, intern. an intern sorry an intern yeah. for the show <laughs> and so we're, I'm excited to introduce our uh, new guy uh, Cody. If you want to bring him up onto the onto the screen here. Uh, guys, meet Jacob. Jacob New. Uh, I make. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If uh, uh yeah, yeah, you, you got can, it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can talk into the microphone. Go ahead. Um, You're allowed to talk. You are allowed really? to talk. Um, yeah, I didn't know producer was allowed to talk. You're allowed to talk, but you're only like you're allowed only like ten words every minute. Otherwise, you don't get. Paid. We have to pay. Yeah, I'll yeah. Count them we have closely. to. There's like a there's a whole yeah, overtime thing we have to work out here that uh, we yeah, just yeah. don't want to get involved with. Um, yeah. we so don't val- invalidate the contract. So yeah, obviously, if you guys have been following along with the show, we've been kind of doing some new stuff. Uh, actually, today I'm using a new microphone for the first time. I don't know how well. Like you probably can tell, I'm using a a little bit of a different setup tell. today. That's good. Well, then there you go. So they'll be able to tell too. Uh, we're using a new microphone today. And we're going to be using some new microphones pretty quickly, pretty soon here too. Jacob's actually using uh, one of the ones that uh, uh, I will be using pretty soon in the next show, I think. Um, and uh, obviously, I've also started doing stuff with Locked On. I'm still writing, and it was just kind of like I've been doing all of our editing and producing for the show, and we kind of needed a little bit of extra help. We needed a little extra hand, so Jacob's going to be helping us out for the time being. He's going to be uh, he's going to be learning the ropes, uh, uh, teaching him how to do some of like the the editing, teaching him how to uh, you know post the shows on the on YouTube and on our anchor uh, platform, and uh, yeah, Jacob, uh, I guess tell us, uh, I guess tell the our listeners uh, a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, my name yeah. is Jacob New. I'm a student at BCIT's um, broadcast and online journalism program, and it's been grateful to be there. I actually met Lachlan in real life there. I've followed him on Twitter for quite a while, and we've kind of connected and, you know, grown over about uh, Canucks uh, fandom and hockey. And, you know, I heard about the Crease cast and this opportunity. I was like, hey, I'd love to help out. So I'm here and I'm willing. Yeah, uh, we're excited to have you, dude. Um, one thing that we should actually... Uh, like that for people who, you know, they probably think they don't, you know, have never heard of you before. Like they might not necessarily know who you are, uh, before this. Um, but they probably, the thing is they probably actually do, uh, because, uh, if you guys remember back in, uh, back in February, uh, TSN, when, uh, TSN 1040, uh, shut down 
there was a there was a little there's a little interesting uh, tidbit where suddenly a new Team 1040 uh, Twitter account popped up, and that was you. That was you setting up that account. You and so I guess just to like, what made you decide to do that? What was uh, what was the, the 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 reasons behind that, and how did that end up going? It was a lot of anger and frustration. Uh, I had woken up and immediately on Twitter, I, people were like, something's wrong with the 1040 stream. And they listened, you know, it had cut to ESPN. I'm like, oh no. So then I spent the next like two hours trying to follow what was going on. And I, I heard the sign off and the switch over when they moved on to the stunting or when it, when it would eventually become funny 1040. And I was mad. Um, People were also talking about how the socials had gone down, like specifically the the TSN 1040, the at TSN 1040 was no longer valid. And so right. I was like, you know what? Why don't I try to jump on that? Now, I wasn't able to get the original. I was, I think it was like TSN 1040 AM. And then mm -hmm. because I was worried about Bell, it eventually just switched over to Team 1040 AM within an hour. <laughs> um, Damn. And it kind of just grew from there. Um, I was, the first day was a lot of, you know, cracking jokes and, uh, just being frustrated against, you know, corporate media. Um, and since then, it's kind of grown into, you know, promoting um, local journalism in Vancouver, especially for people that are up and coming in this industry. You know, I'm in that space right now at BCIT in Lockland is. And you guys have started some incredible stuff with this podcast and video formats. And I know there's a lot of people out there that want some hope going in to this industry. And so I wanted to use that account for the better in that way. Yeah, oh, hell yeah, that you, rocks. That's a that's a go. That's the kind of go getter attitude that you know. That's why we wanted you for the team. Really, we we're exactly. like, you know, this guy works really hard. He gets it, um, and yeah. he looks like he'll do whatever we tell him to. And so, <laughs> kudos to creating that account. I noticed I kept getting our RTs from it. I was like, man, this guy's so supportive. Your yeah. guy or girl? Yeah, you know. Yeah, they, didn't they, know for whoever. sure. Uh, didn't know for sure, but I appreciated the support. And I appreciate the count going around RT and all the, these young content creators in the world. So kudos to you for doing that in your young journalism career. And people, if you're following our channel, as you should be if you're listening to this right now, you should be following Jacob New on his account, Team 1040, or his actual Twitter account, which is... At JKMNEW on Twitter. Hell yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so go follow that. But... And Oh, guess, one thing I did want to ask uh, as well about the the TSN before we move on to the other big signing of this uh, this weekend, <laughs> which I'm sure is where we're gonna go. Um, did any of the t when you when you uh, logged into that account for the first time when you set it up and it started getting a little bit of traction? Did any of the former 1040 people like did they did they reach out to you at all like trying to like figure out what was going like if who was behind that and everything? Now. I did get a bit of attention. I know Patrick Johnson sent a DM and he was wondering, right. you know, who's behind this? Cause it had gone a little <laughs> viral. I think it was probably a, say 700, 800 followers by then. Um, I got a bunch of followers that are also from 1040. I know Matt Sakaris follows the account. He likes some of the tweets that I have. Um, I think it's down to just Matt though. At this point, I know actually Rick Dollywall does follow as well. And he's liked some Hell of yeah. the content that I've done. Um, yeah. nice. but besides PJ, you know, you know, everyone, it was a mystery for a long time who ran that account. I think in July when I did, was now, you know, I had decided I was going to go to BCIT and I wasn't sure what the account was going to be. I decided to just come out and say, Hey, I'm starting something new, uh, at BCIT, but, and you know, this is, I'm this person on this Twitter, you know, if you want to reach out to me, you can. Um, but I do remember there was quite a bit of confusion the day of the shutdown because people were like, was mm -hmm. this a disgruntled employee? Was it a right. staff member? And I, I did send out a tweet, you know, in the evening that day. And I was like, hey, just to clarify, this isn't from anyone from the station. We're not affiliated yeah. with Bell or, you know, the station. I'm just a disgruntled fan. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was quite stressful, though, because there were, I was quite worried. You Bell thought you were going to get come. like sued well, or something like yeah. Bell's lawyers Bell, are going to be. Bell, like banging know, down your door. They had a lot of bad press that day. And, and, you know, maybe they decided that it wasn't worth going after a single Twitter account. That would have yeah. looked even worse for them. But that, um, yeah, that is yeah. intentionally supposed to be parody, right? They don't yeah. want to mm -hmm. ruin any PR that they may have had left uh, in this I mean, market. Much, but, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, hell yeah. We're happy to have you on board, yes. dude. It's going to be really, this, this is the promise, the sign of good things to come for our show. Yeah. Which is great because we haven't really had much uh, going for us uh, recently. Yeah. You no, know, just sweating. Yeah. Freaking out, worrying about 
the big contracts that we're going to be here to discuss uh here i'm going to do the the rude thing and i'm going to bump jacob off here yeah, so yeah we're going to take you yeah that's okay wait, we're taking jacob's going to be people. yeah say Blow goodbye well you'll be yeah you'll be back later things jacob uh yeah jacob is uh will be get like you'll be getting to hear from him a little bit more as we go uh for now we're keeping it pretty cl we're cuz he's new and learning we're uh, we'll keep it like just from jumping in every now and then but yeah uh you'll be getting more jacob stuff. i'm sure down the down the line exactly uh, but yeah, of course, the big news, the reason why you probably tuned into this episode, the big boys have signed. It's we true. all knew it was going to come, but we didn't think it was going to happen this soon. We had been speculating on this program, this show, that Elias Pedersen and Quinn Hughes were going to probably take into the first week of the season, just the way how things weren't progressing with the actual contract negotiations. But then, lo and behold as things always tend to do uh, in Canucks Nation. They got it done on a weekend, starting on a Friday night. I believe it was Thomas Strantz who reported it Thursday night, being like, things are things are cooking while we were recording our last episode. God, that's and, right. Uh, <laughs> we were pretty chill because we had like just wrapped up fit like our episode. Literally, with that news. Cody and had just like, stepped out the door when... <laughs> yeah. The they when it really started going off was yeah. Yeah, I think I think when I got to my car, which was like five minutes after we finished recording, it was like I think Elliot Friedman was like, Pedersen is six at seven seven five. And I like get the text from Lockley being like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's how it felt. It was just like, oh, of course, it's gonna happen where I'm driving home and they're gonna announce the deals. But fortunately, they waited till Sunday, which is good. It's the day before our actual recording day on Mondays. So it actually worked out pretty good. So if you don't know, Lise Patterson signed to a three year, $7.35 million contract. And Quinn Hughes signed to a six year, $7.85 million contract. Both very favorable deals. Obviously probably would have wanted to go long on both. Could only do it with one of them. Overall though, what are your initial thoughts there, Mr. Lachlan? Well, initial thoughts are based on what we expected and what we've been hearing from Canucks management for like most of um, the last the last few weeks and what the rumors have been. I think they did pretty well. I think you know. I think with Hughes especially, there was a big worry that they might just go like the five year or the the deal that walks him right to free agency uh, and and hope that they could keep him around for that time it's weird how little a difference it seems to make like between that five or six but it actually does make a clear like a, it does make a real difference because you're buying ufa years you're paying a little bit uh higher money i would have liked to have seen how much more they needed to pay uh to potentially get uh the full eight to get that full mm -hmm. eight year deal out of him out, out of him but i think you're getting some ufa years out of it you're getting a great defenseman a generational talent for your franchise two two of them frankly a franchise uh, number one defenseman which they've never really had they've before. never had for exactly and you're getting him for under eight million dollars that's in this into even in today's in like this pandemic economy? yeah in even in today's pandemic strapped economy of the nhl salary cap that's impressive with petterson i'm a it's the it's a bridge deal obviously you get a chance to renegotiate again my yeah. biggest worry on that contract is the fact that you are going to have to pay through the nose down the line. The amount of money that Pedersen is probably going to command in what in three years, which isn't much time, and I talked about that in an article today, uh, is going to be probably in that double digits the second time around. It, it was probably going to be double digits this time. It's certainly going to be if he had gone a full eight. It's certainly going to be there the next time around. Which means yeah. the Canucks essentially have about uh, three years to ice a winner and to utilize the money that they didn't spend on this deal to make to to build a winner. Because once that comes, you're going to have to pay him the big bucks. You're going to have to pay him for that full for the money he missed. That's the point of the bridge deal, and that yeah. comes while still managing to sign new another to sign a second a third contract, I should say, for Brock Besser after his bridge deal. Nils Hoaglander's contract is going to come up at some point. Bo Horvat's, JT Miller's, a lot of player, a lot of important players for this franchise Brandon are going to have Brandon Sutter. That's true. I'm sure we'll talk about Sutter a little bit today. Maybe uh, Tim Schaller comes back. Maybe Tim Schaller comes back. Exactly. 
Um, you have three years, and in, in a way, it's almost two in the sense of you have this season because at the end of the season, it's two. At the end yeah. of the second year, you get to start the negotiation period again, and we were pretty much in that negotiation period all season this year. Like, it was hanging over the team the entire season that mm -hmm. when's the Pedersen contract going to get done? Why haven't we heard yeah. anything about the Pedersen contract or the Hughes contract as well? Obviously, with Hughes, there's a more of a long-term, like a long-term solidified situation there. But with Pedersen, it's it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with that space they didn't spend this time around. Yeah, and as, like as you were saying, with like the the final year of Pedersen's deal too, it's it's like a high high number. Like his qualifying offer is ten point two five or something. Yeah. So you have to factor in like Brock Besser's new deal, uh, Horvat's, JT Miller's, like all these guys. You have to remember that in order to hopefully sign Pedersen to that eight year deal, your base amount, your base offer to him is going to be ten point two five plus like ten percent or whatever. Right. So I think one of the comparables that uh, I think Elliot Friedman threw out today, he was like, they, they were originally trying to just land the Kaprizov contract on him for eight years, like eight years at nine or something, mm -hmm. which which would have been great. Of, that would have been great. Kind of, a bit, kind of a missed opportunity a bit if they had had the space and they could go long on him right away. And uh, like that had been pretty good. But I don't think you're really splitting hairs over the next three years i think you've got like you've got the course lot locked in right like you've got hughes you've got petterson you've got horvat for this little okay side note doesn't horvat's deal feel like it's been like this contract for like 12 years like he's just been around forever you know what's weird is it actually feels like the opposite to me it actually feels like really? it, it just got like i feel like we just were talking about his, his him getting his uh his deal out of rfa status like not that long ago it feels like every it yeah it feels every time i stare at his um his contract on cap friendly i'm like man it feels like he's been on this deal for like since he joined the league i guess because he's like a very older it, mature he, person you just assume he's like had a veteran like contract well, status his entire career well it has been eight years like he's been a canuck for eight <laughs> years i think that's <laughs> kind of the or like this is going to at the end of this contract because he signed a five-year deal i believe so he's going into year uh he's this is year eight for him it does it is weird because it feel it yeah he it feels like he's been a canuck forever he is the longest tenured player on the team now because alex edler has gone uh, but, who, by the way, I got to see Alex Edler, um, playing with the Kings. I got to watch the, the game. There was a game, the preseason game in Utah. Uh, it was oh, yeah. him up against, uh, his former, his former defensive line mate, uh, Derek Pouliot, uh, Hell yeah. which, uh, who I forgot was a thing. Um, yeah, it's, it, Horvat's been here a while. It does, it is kind of, it's, it, it is weird how, yeah, you feel like he's been here forever. I feel like he's been here for such a. Like or this contract anyway just got like signed the other day, but like that's yeah, it's well, all it's gonna be it's all blending together. I mean, in the next two years, all of these contracts that are gonna get, be renegotiated every single year, it's gonna be just like a buzzsaw of guys that they need to sign to cap friendly deals. Hey, wait, I guess that's the name where it comes from. Okay, uh, <laughs> just figuring that out now. I'm just putting this two together right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you have like Jack Rathbone too. Like if he has like a breakout year and he's like an RFA, like do you try and sign him to like a four year deal or a six year contract and just like just hope for the best and try and get a low AAV? Like there's a lot of like management they will have to do over the next years to still ice a competitor. And yeah. as most people have already pointed out, their defense is still super rough during that three-year window of Pedersen's. Yeah. It's like, there's the not a lot there. right now looks really bad on the right side. Out, yeah. Out, outside of the group that's already there, who do you really have of coming up? Jet Wu, maybe? Jet Wu. Victor that's, Parison, but he might not be ready for another like th four or when, five when years Pedersen past that contract up, expiring. Right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, basically the only way they're getting anybody new to come in is through a trade or a free agent signing. And generally speaking, that hasn't been this management's uh, success. Uh, that what hasn't that? been a big success for them. So you have to hope that somebody, that somebody good comes through uh, for the, and they, they, they take the right, uh, they pick the right guy.
what was that joke I made like a couple episodes, maybe like 10 episodes ago, where I was like, the the final year of Myers contract is going to get traded for the final six of Darnell nurses. Oh no, that, that would have been that. Yeah, that would have been last. That would have been last uh, in August, I think, or something. God, I, think, I forgot yeah, about that. The free agent Jeez, frenzy, don't but, even make me think about that. <laughs> but if you think about like what this team, like the amount of money that they're going to not have when they re-sign a Horvat or a Besser or whatever, there's not going to be a whole lot to renovate that defense because you've already got it all tied up in Hughes and Ekman Larson. Yeah. And Tucker Pullman, actually, for the next three years, too, or four yeah. years or whatever it is. Uh, so how do you improve if you can't add more dollars to it? You're going to have to make trades. And so you look at guys like Tyler Myers. He's a $6 million man. That's a, I mean, they have shown that they're not afraid to trade the final years of deals if it means getting someone with term in return, which is what they did this last summer. They might have to do it again when their only like minute munching right shot defenseman is like, you know, 36 and going to want another payday or another final payday before he's finally done. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's risky years up ahead. But for you and I, we're like, you know what? This was the biggest headache of the offseason. And yes. the biggest worry of the offseason was what these the term and the dollar value for these deals was going to be. They're out of the way now. We can just focus on hockey again. Yeah. We can just focus on com on complaining about how badly they play. Yes. Which is all we've ever wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, honestly, yeah, it might be like it, it, it might not be the perfect contracts, but at, at least they're done. Like, I think there was even, there was a lot of, I think, concern that this was going to bleed into the regular season, the way things were going, the way it was. Like up yeah. until Friday, it was so quiet on that on the front of where that contract mm -hmm. was gonna go. Um, we don't even have time to talk about the fact that I don't think the today that the you know the Senators still haven't signed Brady Kachuk. Like he's still he's still on he's still out there. They they thankfully got it done before the Senators got Kachuk's done because that would have looked really bad if they were the last ones left. Um, I, that's that's kind of kind of what made the negotiation so interesting, right? Is because you had one agency representing Hughes and Pedersen, and then Brady Kachuk on his island. So, like logically, everyone was like, "Well, if you're CAA or JP Barry or whoever it is, you're not gonna try and negotiate anything if Brady Kachuk is still unsigned. You're gonna wait for the last comparable to come through, and then you're gonna negotiate afterwards." Yeah. But based on what uh, Pedersen and Hughes had been saying in their first uh, media availability, they're pretty much like, we just wanted to come here and play, yeah. which is pretty interesting. Like usually you don't hear about like players like caving or like the agents caving to the team, right? Like it doesn't happen that often, especially now in today's world where the young stars get paid. Yeah. I'm honestly, I didn't, I, that's an interesting takeaway. I didn't necessarily put, connect those dots on that particular thing. I felt like, oh, maybe that's a, you know, I didn't, maybe like for me, I'm just used to the whole, oh, you know, players saying, oh, I, I always happy to be here, even when they're not kind of mm -hmm. thing. But no, I, that, yeah, I guess going back to like some of the past ones, like usually they just talk about uh, how, oh, I'm just happy it's over with. I'm happy we've yeah, dealt yeah. with it. It's not a whole, like, it's not, yeah, there was a little bit more of a sense of like, they feel that this team is good. Like they, I think mm -hmm. like one of the things that the, what did definitely stick out with me is particularly Quinn Hughes talking about how, um, how he felt that Jim Benning did a good job bringing in players this off season and talking about how he felt that he did a good job retooling the roster this season. Normally that's right. not something players talk about all that much, especially like pointing the, well, the GM out by name. I feel like that's going to say, especially after last year when, uh, everyone was like, like saying how they couldn't understand why the management group did what they did lat the previous off season. Yeah. And basically like, that's openly right. Critiqued what they were doing. So they were very, yeah, there was a lot of confusion. Of yeah. Yeah. And you know, uh, he was mentioning he felt that this group is the best, uh, is the best team he's played with in the, in the three years he's been in Vancouver, which is, uh, a little, which is yeah. a little interesting when you consider, like, I think especially that the the twenty nineteen twenty team with Toffoli, with Markstrom, uh, with Tanev was really really good. It's in, it is interesting. I I I think maybe you know that's just that might be a little bit more on the side of player airing the positive vibes out there kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and maybe be, trying to save face a bit and be like yeah. ultra positive on his way in to like 
I don't know. A situation where he does not have a right partner, where he does not have a partner yet, in theory. His partner from last year is gone. His partner from the year before is gone. He, right now, well, uh, we'll talk about Hamannick because apparently he's coming. He's coming back to Vancouver. That's apparently the, the recent... Uh, the recent development is that he is going to play. It just might not be right away. And we will get into that. I'm sure. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a bit hard to get into. Right. Because it's, it's still purely speculation. Right? I mean, like, we I can't mean, even Jim Benning kind of told us like he did. Cause <laughs> yeah, there was that thing like... where he's like their deal. He's like, he, in the same sentence, he basically, if I, re- if I remember correctly, he basically in the same sentence said, uh, uh, the that the Hamannicks are dealing with a family issue, and then proceeded to talk about how we are nearly a hundred percent vaccinated, which is he said it in the funniest way because he was like, um, "I don't like to speculate on personal matters, but <laughs> we're hoping to be a hundred percent vaccinated." It's it's literally it's, like, it's literally you like well you gave it, it away, you gave it away, yeah. you give, and also again, it would be so easy for him to just say. No, it's not a vaccination thing if it wasn't a vaccination thing. So we know what the deal is with Travis yes. Hammock. There might just be an extra thing that we don't know about. Like maybe there's a second wrinkle that we're not anticipating. But we do know that Travis Hammock isn't vaccinated or at least isn't fully vaccinated. So Which which makes the, the him returning thing kind of weird because how awkward is that going to be when – in like a few months he hopes like vaccination rules like relax or something and he can just show up unvaccinated or single dosed yeah. i th- think that's going to be good enough yeah i think like, it is if you're his teammates like aren't you gonna be like like f this guy oh uh, you we, we all did it yeah we couldn't <laughs> yeah not to mention they went through a covid outbreak on the team that completely mm-hmm. took the roster out for two weeks for two weeks yeah um, and some players haven't fully recovered from that or, or they have fully recovered, have, but it but... took them some time. It took them some time, I should say. Um, yeah. but like, I think the deal with Hamnick is going to be that he will, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, I believe the Canucks have already given a, like a hard stance on, no, you can't come if you're not going to get vaccinated. So the only way they'll mm-hmm. let him play is if he's vaccinated. So I imagine it's going to be a case of him reluctantly getting it, uh, like late getting it later and showing up yeah. when it's when he's uh, gone through, I think, what is it? The two you have to wait two weeks or something for it to right, fully yeah. kicked in, sort of thing, or there's something, like or that. something along those lines. Um, and then he'll show up. It will be, I'm sure, a little awkward when he does show up and not having not you know having it taken that long to get vaccinated. There was already you know, I mean, there's already I've heard the couple of people talking about with like Tyler Bertuzzi's case, um, how how it might be hard for teammates to really be okay with that guy's decision, not just from a, uh, their own safety standpoint, but also from the whole, what if they start losing games because he's not showing up to half of them or to a bunch of them. Right. And you wonder how that kind of, how that kind of gets sorted out in the locker room. I don't believe, uh, I know, I know Hughes mentioned in his, um, in the press conference that he hadn't talked to Hamannick in about a month or something. Like it had been that long since they had had any sort of conversation. That might just be because they don't chat. Like they don't text. They're not texting. Yeah. They don't he's have a, a texting he's relationship. A chi- he's a child. He's a 21 year old child. They're not like sending me. They're not sending with yeah, kids. They're not sending memes back and forth <laughs> uh, like you and I no. do. Um, it, it isn't like Chris Tanev, right? Who was like 33 years old and like, and could he didn't have kids and just kind of like was a huge stoner, right? No, oh. it's <laughs> yeah. totally different. Just a Way total dad, relatable. like dad, and just also like, and also the fact that frankly they could you know get to know each other over dinner and stuff was even a thing. Yes. Uh, the last time they were t- when Chris Tanev and Chris and Quinn Hughes were teammates, they couldn't do that last year even if they wanted to. Um, right. Yeah, that's I think with I think with Petey and Quinn, you're going to see a little. I think just the fact that like stuff is going to kind of calm down around the team is really going to throw a bit be a big benefit for the group mm-hmm. um obviously we still have a lot of like roster decisions to figure out and uh stuff to talk about like from the last couple games here yeah why don't we get into it yeah. um because there's there was quite a bit to take away from the sunday game uh i was very very hungover clipping that game that's probably why my back is really messed up right four, now. 4 p.m but... starts are too early for you <laughs> They, yeah, it is way too early. I need stuff a bit later in the day, guys. Please, don't, you're killing me with these uh these early morning games. Uh, but Canucks beat the Manitoba Meese um three to two or something. Uh, had a goalie change for the Canucks at one point. It was uh, Halak did the first two periods, then DiPietro did the third. Um, 
not really too much to take away. It was basically just like, let's see what Jack Rathbone can do. Uh, still auditioning that bottom six. The big noteworthy stuff was Vasily Podkolzin on the fourth line with Will Lockwood and... Um, would have been uh, was... Justin Dowling probably? Oh, no, or... Carson Folk. Carson, Carson Folk. Folk, that's right. His first Carson game of preseason because he was off of uh, IR. And... Um, who was it with uh, Rathbone was the night? It was uh, Madison Bowie. It um, was yeah. It was ba- was it Bowie? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was basically like an like just the auditions for like the the third right shot defenseman and basically whatever Bod Colson was up to, and then the Canucks awful, <sighs> awful, awful power play. <laughs> That 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 they're working on it. They're getting better. I think. Uh, I mean, I honestly thought. You know what? I will say with the power play. I thought they looked. There were points where they looked a lot. The second unit in particular looked a lot better than they normally do. And that was with a group right. that's normal. And that was with a group that is not made up mostly of NHL guys, <laughs> but yeah. against a team, against a team, an opponent that also not made up mostly of NHL guys. Um, no, but I will say. They- they were kind of screwed. Yeah, they were they were in a bad spot. Like they were just in trouble. I mean, I think the can I think you got a better performance out of that group than say the group before it. Like the in the Calgary game, like the Calgary game, they looked. Uh, there they were looked points brutal. where NHL guys were looking brutal, and it was yeah, it was a bad game for that group. But the 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 Sunday game, they played in front of a crowd again for the first, or at least in front of a Rogers Arena crowd, I should say, for the first time uh, since March of 2020. I I will say the players that stuck out to me. Uh, mm-hmm. There were a couple of players that stuck out to me in that Winnipeg game, specifically uh, Justin Dowling, Will Lockwood, and Phil DiGiuseppe, who are all the kind of the guys who are really fighting for that for for that fourth line spot for those fourth line spots. Uh, yeah, you know, because right now it really, I think we can all agree that right now it's down. It's it it went from one spot maybe available to clearly there are at right now there are three there are a full three because Mott's injured. I don't think Brandon Sutter's coming back, and it certainly do- and there's no- there was already one spot available beforehand. I think that Lockwood, in- Lockwood in particular, is the guy that I realized I had been forgetting and been kind of leaving out of our like projections for where the fourth line was gonna go. I felt like I've been kind of leaving him out. Like I- instead of him, it was Gat like Gadjevich was getting a lot of the recognition I think from us, um, right. but. Lockwood looked great in that game. Like he was throwing hits. He was making good offensive plays. He was putting himself in a spot. Like he was doing everything you want out of a fourth line guy, out of a depth guy, I think. Yeah, he he looked pretty decent. Like he he's basically doing what like like say like a Tyler Mott would be doing in a game without like the penalty killing, really. Yeah. That's the only separator that's really gonna distinguish these bottom six like eligible players. That's why guys like you know Nick Patan and Phil D. Giuseppe and uh, Justin Dowling, why they're sticking out is because they have the ability to kill penalties. Lockwood, Gadjevich, they haven't really gotten a look there yet, but he's doing all like the other stuff like really well. Like he's throwing his body around. He's pretty pretty much hitting anything that moves, which is how you get noticed in this league. It's how you leave a mark. Even if the points aren't coming, they're going to know that like, Hey, the will Lockwood brand of hockey is what we want to see on our fourth line. It's a guy that checks hard. He battles on the boards. Uh, Yeah. He makes mistakes here and there, but you know, he's, he's a battler and that's something that this, uh, management group has been praising for the last four years like they love the the phrase we want to be hard to play against and that's yes. kind of what lockwood's mo is is playing a brand of hockey that makes it difficult for any line to play against because you're probably going to get smattered into the boards or whatever yeah that's his game simple effective it seems to be working i think if he scores some points maybe there'd be more like credible discussion about whether he's going to make the team like because he doesn't require waivers like you just kind of know he's going to probably be in Abbotsford right away but he'll probably get like a, one of those first call up type situations like Adam Godet a couple of years ago that's right it was like like he had earned himself a place on the NHL roster but because of waiver considerations it just made more sense to just send him to the AHL first yeah. let him play a few games and then bring him up yeah get a and longer so look at one of the guys who can't pass waivers just in case give them the opportunity first yeah. and then if they can't do it go for the guy who has it i think Troy Stetcher also went through that in his uh, first year with the Canucks as well 
Yeah, I be- I've yeah, because he he played five games or something for Utica or whatever, and yeah. then he was immediately in the NHL. I think Horvat did the same, but his was an injury uh, conditioning stint. Yeah, kind of different, but like same idea, right? Like if you have guys on your roster who are waive or don't require waivers, like you usually just send them to the AHL so that you don't run the risk of losing guys for nothing. Um, but man, in my hierarchy right now, like I honestly think like Zach McEwen is like out. Yeah, me too. I I think he played, I think, I mean, I said it beforehand, like I think maybe our first episode of like the season, I said, I think Zach McEwen's played himself off of the team. Yeah. That was last, yeah. Last episode we talked about that. And then the flames game happened and I think it got worse for him because he, because anything, not only did he, you know what he did, he didn't do much. And then there was the one play. This is the play that like, that stuck out of this game. Kill, and this is for another it. player that really, I think cemented it was there was the play in the second period where, uh, uh, flames are entering the zone or the Canucks are trying to exit out of their zone. Jason Dickinson has the puck. Nikita Zadorov steps right into him and just flattens him. It's a good, it's a clean mm-hmm. hit. There's nothing wrong. It's not a dirty hit. It's a perfectly totally legal check. Uh, just, you know, it's a very, it's a very shocking. It's boot. a good hit. It was a good hit. Yeah. Yes. It was a very good hit. And you know, Dickinson gets right back up. I think he gets right back into the play pretty yeah, quick. He tries to play the ho- game of hockey, but Shen and McEwen are just Luke, like Shen and Zach McEwen try and go Zadorov into like fighting while the flames yeah. have the puck. And they like, and it's a completely clear. It's a completely fine hit. It's just like, oh, and boys. suddenly they're like caught in a three on two or like a four on two or something. And the Flames score. And you're just looking at Shen and Zadorov having, like, an argument. By this point, McEwen has gotten back into the play. But he is so, it's like, so it, late. it is it so late. Matter. It doesn't even matter. It is just, like, I looked at them like, oh, God. Like, uh, that is a mess. That is the type and of play that gets you benched very and quickly. And it got worse because I think I said to our to you in our last episode, I was like, just count how much how many shifts he's just chasing behind a guy hitting him with the stick. Cause that's all he's got. And then in the third period, he hasn't played that much. I think he was like sub eight minutes or sub nine minutes or whatever. Like it was not a lot of ice time for a no. guy that should be like an NHLer playing against like an AHL team. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he gets flattened along the boards by, you know, some AHL defenseman for Calgary. And he just stays there and eventually gets in a fight with, Former uh, Canuck and current NHL uh, Erica Branson. Man, uh, Erica Branson. And he lost. They get in a little fisty cuffs, and he gets he gets sunned by a uh, guy. Who, it, keep in mind who doesn't fight actually as much as we think. Erica Branson has no, not had a lot of career he's fights. Big. He's That's just it. big. He I think he had like when he when he left the Canucks. I think his total was three ever in his entire yeah, career. Did. It was That's low. Why, that's why it was so very funny when um, uh, Pedersen got injured and it, Good Branson had like his quote where he's like, "Well, who wouldn't have happened if I was on the ice?" It's like, it was like yes, it would. Yes, yeah, it would, Gutty. Be quiet. Yeah. It uh, that, it was that, and like I <laughs> like on those, and then you know the Zadorov play as well. Just the, I remember somebody pointed to, out to me on Twitter. They were like, or said to me on Twitter, they're like, you know, ah, it's the preseason. I don't care about like who cares, right? And I'm like, and you know. He's right in a sense that, or uh, the I don't remember exactly who it was that tweeted at me, but they were right in a sense that, yeah, it's the preseason. But if Pedersen or Bo Horvat does something like that, I am a little bit like, hmm, you shouldn't have done that. But it's the preseason. I'm not worried. The yeah. thing is, I'm looking at it from the I was looking at it from the sense of if I'm Travis Green and I see yeah. my players doing that and in, in getting involved in like a pointless argue like pointless trying to like go to guy into a fight instead of focusing mm. on the score on the on the scoring chance around them am i taking yeah. that player over say a guy like will lockwood who hasn't done that or di giuseppe yeah. who kills penalties and also hasn't done that or justin mm. dowling who i think act who i think is very steady is doing a really good job in uh luke shen's case i think he's really battling now with brad hunt <laughs> who's looked really good in his couple games, like in the sense or of Kyle like, Burrows, or Kyle or Burrows. Burrows. Let's not count out Kyle Burrows. He's also done very well. I, I yeah. think you're suddenly in a spot where you're seeing uh, some guys who more or less kind of had a, a spot sewn up. It, it was theirs to lose and they're losing it. They're quickly losing yeah. that spot to guys more deserving. 
yeah the, it's kind of funny like the before preseason started most people like you know they had luke shen in the lineup they had zach McEwen and matthew heimer Le- heimer high more high more guaranteed in the lineup and sure maybe their experience will end up with them on the starting 23 on opening night but i don't think it's like a guarantee that they'll stick uh Travis Green has been pretty open so far this camp when guys are underperforming. He said it after the Calgary Flames loss that some guys are playing like they can't even keep up with the league. And that's what these preseason games are for is determining who can even keep up in this league, which felt like a direct shot at players like Zach McEwen, players like Matthew Highmore, players like um, Ole Uolevi. And wouldn't you know it, the guys that didn't suit up in that Sunday lineup were Yule Levy, McEwen, and Highmore. Yeah. It's a lot, it's a lot to read into where Mc, or, uh, Green is trying to see who's going to make this team, and we know it from years of experience that the Canucks will put guys on waivers to play in the AHL if they think they haven't earned their spot. And Sven that's... Berchi, big like, famous one. Yeah. That that's... was just two years ago. Yeah, and that's a good thing. Like, you want teams that are willing to make that decision sometimes, that they're, like, you know, they're not going to let uh, what, like, what say what their cap hit is. Uh, is they're not going to let that dictate whether, where they where they belong in the, 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 in the organizational, like, roster or rankings, I guess. And you and yeah. I were talking about it after the Calgary game, uh, oh, that right now you look at a guy, say, like, Jonah Gadjevich right now. He's your former second rounder. You just lost yeah. Cole Lind to Seattle in the expansion draft. And Gadjevich, to his credit, has looked okay. Like, he's looked pretty good. I don't think he played in the Winnipeg game. Uh, he didn't play in the Winnipeg game. No. He, uh, uh, But in the Calgary game, he was actually one of the few players that actually stepped up and did something and uh, made Agreed. a good— uh, Was playing very well. Uh, yeah, got he a goal. Ha- got a goal uh, on a good just putting getting his body to the front of the net. Something the Canucks have long been looking for in a forward. They have not had a forward that does that that is the net front presence. So you know they're going to kind of maybe value that with him. And mm-hmm. you and I were asking the question of like, if you're the if you're the Canucks organization, if you're trying to choose between either sending down to Zach McEwen, a guy who by all accounts like you love his story and everything. But he's a, you know, he's an undrafted guy. He hasn't necessarily amounted to much at the NHL level. Or like, are you going to lo- risk him on waivers, or are you going to risk your former second rounder who might garner a longer look? And right now, that seems like that if the t- the tiebreaker is going to go to the younger guy, is it not? You'd think, and it is like worth noting that I think in the bottom six, Jonah Gadjevich is the only one that's scored i'm pretty sure what yeah outside uh, of he, like uh he set, chase up waters. Chase, who, he set up chase waters for that goal and he got his own on a ul heavy shot so. that's right but other than that i don't think jason dickinson's picked up any points this mm-hmm. preseason justin dowling i don't think has anything either like yeah if you're if we're going if we're going by just like the raw point totals like yeah. he's he's earned it over all of them and yeah. i think matthew highmore has like an assist or whatever yeah points but, aren't everything but that does factor in like that definitely yeah, factors uh, in when you want scoring from your bottom six i i would like to see gadjevich given like a, a fourth line look with D Giuseppe and justin dowling on the next like home game or sorry not home game away game where they're probably going to be playing against an actual nhl lineup because so far he's kind of played. I mean, I guess he played against the Flames, like NHL team, and yeah. the Seattle one. I think, and he looked and good he against the he held his own in both. Yeah. Sure so, did. but like obviously, you want to see what he can do against like the toughest competition. Because it's one thing being a fourth line player against like the Flames AHL Stockton fourth line, but it's a whole different beast if you're holding your own against you know mason appleton and so and so on seattle yeah or, seattle is 100 percent icing their nhl team right now i don't think they've played yeah i, I think i think they've even in the games i think they've gone on the road for i don't think they've mm-hmm. i don't think they've necessarily thrown in too many of their farm of their farm team guys because partially just because they don't have many yet but they're yeah but even then they just are kind of still uh, trying to just build team chemistry with their nhl lineup because they're all new they've never played with any, each other 
Uh, mm-hmm. they're, and they're, you know, they're, you're going to get a much better look at what these guys can do. And right now, I mean, there is what's nice about the way the Canucks, what the Canucks situation right now is in theory, they could have Dowling, Lockwood, Di Giuseppe and Gadjevich all up with the NHL team at the same time. All those could yeah. be your four extra forwards who come up with the, the top nine. We've already spent a lot of time talking about in these, uh, in these shows mm-hmm. so far. And it would come at the cost of say a McEwen. Penalty would, killing. Yeah. Some pen, a little bit of penalty killing. Uh, just who a doubt. Da- yeah. Who needs penalty killing? The Canucks don't take penalties. Not anymore. No. Just too many men ones. Just too many men penalties. That was so great when that happened. That was so awesome. It, it was it, like, yeah, it's still the same Canucks. I, know I and swear love. to God. I don't think any, I don't think any team, like I, I think Travis Green is a great coach. I don't think any <laughs> coach in Canucks history has more too many men calls than the teams he's coached. I think There's it so- is a country mile between him and the next guy for that penalty. Every single time when they get called for it too, they do the shot of him on the bench, and every time he looks like so pissed, like he's just like <laughs> yeah. another one, huh? Uh, this is yeah, too much, man. It's so good, yeah. He's um, it is. It's so funny how many times that gets called, and I don't know. I forget who it was, but somebody was like, "Oh, it's fitting that in the first game with fans in the building, people uh, they got it too many men penalty." I thought that was yeah. that was Great. well played. That was a well played, yeah. yeah. Um. Other other standouts, uh, just quick quick hitters. Uh, Brad Hunt, he's looked good. Uh, yes. Madison Bowie and Kyle Burrows, in my opinion, have looked a lot safer and more responsible than Luke Shen. Yeah, Luke Shen looks very old and slow. Yeah, to the point where I wouldn't trust him across a full eighty-two. No, and I think we were there at the beginning of the season. Even like we didn't want him playing eighty-two. Like I, we talked yeah. about how. Um, if he can like he can play with Hughes or with Rathbone in a pinch, but you don't want him playing. But if you have him playing eighty two, that's because your organization doesn't have enough depth in that spot. Um, yeah. Brad Hunt has looked really good, and I believe Brad Hunt can play both sides of D. He's not a he can yeah. jump between the two, which is bodes well for him because he's a. Mm-hmm. I think he did a really good job at being like low risk, not taking a lot of like he made some very smart plays and actually put himself in a good spot to get a few scoring chances, but he didn't do it. Uh, at the uh, at the risk of the def- at, of the defensive side of the puck, which is what they need from him, and yeah. just that safety with him is really good. And yeah, you're right. Bowie has been a lot better than I gave him. I would have given him credit for. I thought he was. Uh, he's. Uh, I expected him fully to be one of like the first guys to go, just because I didn't yeah. see a spot for him. But he's looked good, and Burroughs as well. I throw that in that mix as well. Yeah, those two options are pretty interesting because they're both pretty smooth skating defensemen. They're pretty pretty safe in their own zone they don't really like pinch in or go deep like bowie did on the the nick Batan goal but like that was the first time he ever like joined a rush it's just very interesting because bowie only played something like four games of pro hockey last year uh he just did not get an opportunity even when he was traded to the canucks they didn't even bother giving him a look at the end of the season he was just seattle protection he was just seattle defense protection. yeah and I almost feel like the, the organization didn't even have like an idea of what to do with them. They were just like, we're just, he's just here so we can, you know, meet the exposure requirements, but we have no interest in him, but he's looked good for my money's worth. Like if you wanted to throw him and Rathbone out for oh wow 12 minutes of five V five, like a night, like I'm not going to really fight against that. Like I thought they looked decent enough. All things considered, if it was Brad Hunt, that's it, that position. Like I'm not, gonna argue with that either um other than the guys competing for jobs though like uh one of the guys that really stood out i'm sure to you as well was connor garland yes like that guy is fan favorite fan favorite fans very quickly i mean we i think we said this about last year that it sucked that no like fans weren't in the stands for niels hoglander's debut yes and now he's gonna have a sophomore slump it's gonna be like a bit of a harder season because people are gonna be tuning it or at more don't wish that game. upon upon short king nils how dare you have you watched him play in this preseason he like people a, are on him pe- they know what they're doing they know what he does he still gets away with a lot because he's that effing good but it's going to be a lot harder for him this year i think he looks so, much better in the se- in the the jets game i will give him credit there he looked a lot better when he was he playing very with pearson good, but and again, Horvat again when he got back to his that, regular line mates that was like a 
like a couple NHL lines versus like true the Manitoba Moose. It was Pierre Luc Dubois and his merry band yeah. of men. That was that was and the, he okay like his merry band of moose. Th- this is a Vancouver podcast, so we don't really talk about the other teams unless like major trades and stuff goes off. But Pierre Luc Dubois, Dubois man does not look good. <laughs> that was like uh, I'm sorry he he looked really bad oh yeah against the Canucks and I honestly forgot he was on the ice most of the time him and uh him and uh Tucker Pullman for the Canucks we haven't even talked about Tucker Pullman geez I think he because you know what it is with Pullman as well is that he we know he's gonna be on the final roster just because of how they don't have anyone else we know he's gonna be there and the safest and most reliable option even though he is really unspectacular. He is. I, literally, I forgot he was on the ice yesterday until I think it was, I, I want to say it was, uh, might have been Brad Hunt, who passed him the he, puck, and he just, <laughs> and he gets the shot, and he just over the glass, right over the whatever. net, like sailing his, miles over the net. And I'm like, shot, oh yeah, Tucker Pullman's here. <laughs> his shot is so fucking bad. It's like, not great. Honestly, it's not great. <laughs> for for two point five million dollars for the next four years, and you got a guy who can't even do a high flip without sending it over the fucking net. Like that's gonna be a long contract to deal with, man. Like sure oh he's sure he skates great for a dude who's like six foot five and whatever, and he looks like Chris O'Dowd from Bridesmaids, but he <laughs> just his puck handling is so pathetic for a pro NHL or making two and a half million dollars. I like it's rough. I, I clipped the, sh- the, the play where he gets us the blue line or the center line. And he goes to do a high flip for Phil D Giuseppe to chip and chase. Oh, that's oh, it's it just, Giuseppe. Just that's sends right. It over the net. Yeah. I'm like, how have you played as many games as you have? And you don't know how to high flip without sending it out. It was, it was bonkers. It like, insane. yeah, I, I'm willing to give him at least a slight pass in the sense of like, it's the, again, it's the preseason. It's pre- I'm willing to give him like, and like, I'm not, I'm willing to not hit the panic button on him. But again, yeah. it doesn't bode well that I forgot he was on the ice for an entire <laughs> game. I think he actually had the least, the lowest ice time of all the def- uh, of all the defenders in that game against the Jets. I think even Burroughs and Hunt were getting more ice time than he is. Um, it, it's, it, it's, I'm a little, I'm worried with him. I'm a little worried well, with him there. Maybe that's a good thing that he's not stack, uh, sticking out too much, but uh, yikes, well, I'm not thing, loving right? it. Like, I'm not loving it. Like sticking out can be good or bad, right? Like Rathbone, yeah. he sticks out because he does a lot of things very loudly. Like when he makes mistakes, they're very noticeable because he's trying a lot to try and break out of the zone or he's trying to uh, defend uh, defend yeah. rushes, strip guys of the puck or in that uh, last create game. opportunities, like whatever it is. Like and- you notice him more when he makes his mistakes. Like when Pullman or OEL or whoever make their mistakes, they're a lot more subtle because usually it's stuff like I'm being beaten on the outside or I make the wrong read. Uh, whereas a guy like Jack Rathbone, who's trying to do all of the offensive work and the defensive work for say, like, a like a Luke Shen or yeah. maybe for a Tucker Pullman, like whoever it is, like he's compensating heavily for their shortcomings and it doesn't really look good for him, but you know, it's coming from a good natured place. Yeah. Tucker Pullman. It's like, you'd never notice him. And it's kind of for a bad thing because you know it's because he can't shoot the puck. And he can't on do it. He's, he's kind of just out there. He's it's uh, he's just kind of out there killing there. some time. And yeah, he's with, there to receive a pass and occasionally move it through center, and that's about it. Yeah, like Rathbone struggled. Rathbone's a good example, like especially because uh, I think it was Daniel Wagner who pointed out that Rathbone was really having trouble in the last game, like holding onto the puck his puck control Mm -hmm. uh, was was not was really not at its best compared to what we know from him there was the one play where he tried to make the pass i think it was to uh to brad hunt right in front of the the cross ice pass in front of the net oh that was bowie and bowie yeah yeah, that's bowie and he he fumbled it the jet picked it up and uh luckily halak uh yaroslav halak was there to make the save by the way yaro uh quick side note on halak i think he looked Oh, I think he looked pretty good in his for his first game with the team. I think he, I I yeah. can see some things that he has to work on, but overall I liked his performance. Yeah, with Rathbone, you didn't notice. That was when you noticed. Oh, he's having a tough night, uh, with yeah. the and the puck battles. But again, that's because most of the time he's very reliable and he's very solid. With yeah. Pullman, 
yeah, you don't, you're not noticing much from it all. He's just kind of out there to maybe kill some ice time, and the Canucks don't need that right now from their from the from the right side, especially. They don't need guys who can just kill time. They need someone who can make a difference when they step on the ice for the better. And right How? now, they don't have many of them. There's not a lot. Do you think this? This is an, like, obviously a really difficult question to answer, but. Do you think that the Canucks strategy of having all their puck moving defensemen on the left side, do you think like it's telegraphed too heavily and teams are going to be able to like adjust to that like very early in the season? That's a great like, they're question. Just gonna, they're just going to stack down the right wing and force them to go uh, cross ice and they're going to be screwed. I think that that is possible. I mean, it is difficult because, you know, not every team say cuz right, usually your right your winger is lined up on that guy. Like your winger is going to be the guy lined up to cover that defenseman uh, mm-hmm. most of the time, and there's no guarantee that say your right defense is going to be a lot more tough on that attack than say the left side is or something or whoever would sure. be covering that guy. But it is possible that they could be like say like if they notice there's a obvious like uh, flaw in that like kink in the armor there uh, mm-hmm. the, the Achilles heel you could be say maybe double shifting a guy who you normally wouldn't just because you can because he's more tough on that defenseman in the in the zone he knows he can force them to make a bad pinch or a quick yeah. pass that they shouldn't uh, that is entirely that is something that could be factored in uh, to the year I don't it might be you might, you might you're right it might be too early to tell if that's gonna be the case especially because right. you know this year especially like compared to last year it's gonna be a little bit less of a well we have played this team five times already game number six this time we already know what to expect from them like you did with the North division last year and playing exclusively against six teams it'll be a little bit of a different sort of situation but yeah, you could see a scenario where they're kind of just throwing everything at that one side with Hughes, Rathbone, and OEL, and just l- hoping they <laughs> force they are forced to go yeah. more to rely more on Myers, Pullman, and I guess I guess I hunt right now, or maybe Shen or Hamannick, whoever it is, at that third guy. It's not going to be Hamannick for at least the first month, as confirmed by the team. Yep. Or. Not the team, but sorry, but Elliot Friedman was like, I don't expect him to be in there opening night, but no. he might be there eventually. Um, someone who won't also be featured in preseason for a while and hopefully will be with the team come opening night is uh, Broccoli Besser. Um, I, I hated the phrasing that they were using in their release or in their media availability when they're like, Brock Besser is out for the rest of preseason. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because man. if you're if you're just scrolling through Twitter and you see Brock Besser's out for the preseason, your brain kind of skips over the pre and you just see, says the what? out for the season, yeah. and you're like, "What? No, no! take me instead. Take uh, my limbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will cut. I will. I will give you my limb, Brock. Just go do your thing. Um, yeah, yeah Besser. So. Uh, and, and this is a very clear. This is a very. Uh, we're we're shouting out uh, Wagner a lot today because he was one of. The, he actually pointed this out. Like uh, Connor Garland in that game against Calgary blocks the shot late in the game. Connor Garland. We yeah. talked a little bit about Connor Garland. Connor, buddy, you got to know which team you're playing for here. This team yeah, uh, has bad luck. We have. I don't know what. Uh, what. Uh, what. Uh, like. Uh, cemetery we desecrated as a franchise, but oh, do we have some ghosts when it comes to the injuries. And as soon as you see Garland struggling to the bench to get back, like after that shot, you're like, God, he's done for months, isn't he? Like you're done for months. And then Wagner pointed, like was saying in the game, like after Garland came back, he was clearly fine. It just stung him. He came back and finished the game. He played last night. He was like, he said it late in that game. He was like, I'm going to say right now, thank God Pedersen and Hughes are signed right now. And if Garland is not (laughs) able to go, and that kind of yeah. set off the what do you know? And I said to you, and I said to you, I think Bess. Oh God, Besser's hurt, isn't he? Because we hadn't heard from him in the first week, and then immediately after the game, Travis Green says he'll be out a week. And even to me, I was like, I don't think it is a week. I don't think they bring it up if it's just a little ah, he'll be fine kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I was like, I think he's done for the preseason. I don't think he'll <laughs> play again. Which yeah, maybe. Maybe it's not that bad, and they're just trying to like you know preserve him because again these games don't matter, and you want to have him rest fully rested for the regular season. 
But I could tell, but I honestly could tell right from the get-go that, oh, he's actually hurt and he's going to be out for the rest. They're not playing. He won't play again in this preseason. I, and I he will that, never knew that before again. they said it because it was like, yeah, they wouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. It wouldn't have even been a talking point. Very clearly, yeah. and that's a huge loss. That's a big loss, especially after last season where he finally played a full year healthy. He didn't, he didn't get hurt once. Brock Besser died in preseason, so Elias Patterson and Quinn Hughes could get signed. Yeah, he he walked so they could run. That's uh, that's what it took. <laughs> yeah. It took them going, "Oh my God, our our best friend, we must be we must be by his side." Like that's what it took to get them to come home. Yeah, uh, you boys hurt. Get or let us sign you so yeah. you can come visit him in the hospital. His 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 one wish was for you to be signed. Like it's like it's like. <laughs> It's like it's like is there, there willing him out of the arena? It's like it's Sign like my yeah, buddies. yeah. He's just like he's like doing like he he went to acting school during the summer. He's been like he was like an extra on some TV show, and he's using it, putting it to good use. He's like, please, Attaboy. please, my family, bring them to me. Like <laughs> that's that was the whole that was how and that's how they got signed. Like we'll hear about that in an athletic uh, in an athletic. There you go. Uh, like um. Uh, what is it like the oral, oral history like the oral yeah. history oral of how history Patterson of and Hughes got signed extension. yeah exactly oh, yeah. Um, all right well that about sums up the Canucks news um, let's get into the crazy shit yeah that dropped I'm admittedly almost hesitant to get into this just because I feel like we're there is so much we don't exactly know about what went on no. here but it has to be <laughs> talked about because it was the story of the weekend there, there was a lot coming out of Robin Leonard's Twitter handle last night or the night before, and a lot of backtracking done today by oh. several news outlets and Leonard himself. Um, but basically, I guess Robin Lehner was going to bat for his former teammate, Jack Eichel. And I mean, I admire him for wanting to change the culture of NHL and hockey but he came out swanging <laughs> because he accused several teams, including the Philadelphia Flyers, of prescribing uh, Ambien and painkillers without disclosing their effects to the players. Um, he called for Elaine Vignolt to be fired and called him a dinosaur coach, which is <laughs> really funny. Um, but then... After this tweet storm where he's basically just saying the NHL has my number, they can call me uh, because the doctors and psychiatrists should be the ones that are prescribing this shit, not like team uh, support staff, which was like pretty eye opening there. I mean, obviously, there's the what was the ESPN special like the some the something of pain the price of pain oh, the TSN uh, Rick Westhead uh, documentary yeah. on the price of pain where which uh, Ryan Kessler was actually in because uh, he yeah, talked so about I believe toward this all, toward all usage yeah I believe this was uh, I believe that started during his time with the Ducks I could be wrong it could have been with yeah. Vancouver I might but I but of course his biggest injuries real injury issues really came after he left the Canucks and he started really dealing with uh, his body breaking down in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. I don't know that for sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, we don't know. But yeah, it's, Kessler, it's, it's but Kessler being in it was very important, was a big deal because he was yeah. uh, technically he's still under contract, I think, with the Ducks. I think he's technically yeah. still uh, a member of the team. Yes, technically. Um, but so what also came out of the Leonard um, tweet storm was former Vancouver Canuck Tom Sestito chiming in and being like, when I went to the Pittsburgh Penguins, they took a look at the Ambien and vitamin T as he called it Toradol that he was being prescribed and they were like shaking their heads in disgust at what he was being told was good for him. Um, I guess he was going to bat and saying like, not all teams are like the Buffalo Sabres or the Philadelphia Flyers. What team had he been on? Things. What team had he been on prior? Cause this was not, um... he was, um, so he went from Toronto, I believe, to Anaheim. Or sorry, not Anaheim, uh, uh, Pittsburgh. Or Pittsburgh to Toronto, one of the two. One of those, but okay. The The point being is like a lot of players kind of chimed in, basically being like, yeah, this is obviously a huge issue. It's like our rights to know what we're being given by our doctors, especially when it comes to sleeping medication and obviously stuff like painkillers, like Toradol. Um, so then this morning... Uh, 
the the shitstorm kind of grew a bit more because Laner backtracked and said he didn't mean to say that Elaine Vignalt was one of the ones issuing Ambien and painkillers to players. He was just saying he's heard he's a shitty coach and just wants him fired. <laughs> Robin Leonard is a uh, interesting so guy. Great. He's got he's. he's we should get him on the show, man. Like he's. I would like love to have Robin Leonard on the show. I've heard he's actually very. I've heard he's a very nice guy. I've heard he's a very nice. He looks uh, very nice, and yeah. all the post game handshakes that he's been in with Vegas, he always looks so he's, chipper. He's intense, he but lost. like he's clearly an intense guy. But like that's lots of athletes. It's like that's a pro it's like athlete. Well mean. It's like well meaning intensity. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, oh, so interestingly, so yeah. actually, the team that he came. Okay, this is actually kind of interesting. The team that Tom Sestito came to from the Penguins was the Canucks. That was 2015, so that was coming right off of uh, the year. He only played three games with the Canucks in 2014-15. He played uh, 10 with the Utica Comets. Prior to that, he played – that was the year – it was the Tortorella year where he played in yeah. 77 games. Um, so didn't, that might actually uh, end up coming to play here. We'll be – I'll be I interested was gonna to say, see how that goes. Don't – what – no one – nobody quote me on this. Nobody source no. this. This is all just going off of the – the last vestiges of my memory banks. Um, didn't the Canucks overhaul their entire medical and support staff when Jim Benning took over? That's right. They did 20, actually, yeah. in fact, the year in after Sestito left in 2015, 16. So the first year, 2014, 15, that he, Benning was there, it was the original yeah. staff. And then they overhauled it that off season. Yeah. It got completely and then it was the so, all- injury started happening with their players so you have to wonder interest that is those, that's years where the canucks weren't really that prone to injuries uh was that because of whatever they were i would love to players? know i would love to know what went into that i i mean again pure speculation pure Please speculation do don't not quote, us on this. quote that as us saying we we know yeah. anything we don't know anything yeah. on that and we're not gonna we're not gonna you know Point if you're fingers gonna quote here anywhere. anything from this show, please attribute it to our new producer Jacob New at Twitter. <laughs> yeah, he, he's looking at me. He's like, please don't, like, no, please don't do that. He's no. like, no, um, yeah. yeah, no. The thing that we can take out of this for sure is this: it's that hockey clearly has had some issues uh, with, with um, how they handle injuries and how they uh, how they. Um, try and heal those injuries with their players. There's been a lot of cases right now, the one with the Jack Eichel one being the prime example of uh, a team seeming to put their own uh, success and their own chances of winning over the long-term health and safety of a player. And part of that comes with the fact that players are not in control, in full control of what they do with their body um, mm -hmm. because when they sign an NHL contract. And as it, it very much is going to come down to this situation of, well, okay, we're seeing this with Eichel now in a, in a, a less, uh, I don't want to say less serious way because that's not necessarily the case. It's serious to them and it's serious to the person who's dealing with it. But just in this, you know, it's not a case of necessarily prescription drug uh, over, over, over prescribed drugs. Um, it, this is a player who needs a surgery who's not getting, who hasn't gotten it from the team because they don't want to devalue his trade. His, they don't want to bring his trade value down. And that's yeah. that can't be okay. Like you can't allow that. If you're the NHLPA, what the hell are you doing? Like why are you cannot yeah. be letting that happen? And the fact that we're at this point with him, the fact that we're at this point with other players who have been dealing with this for in quiet in silence really for a long time is sad and disappointing. And you hope that we're seeing it things like this, and you're hoping that people like Robin Leonard that people start. Uh, that other players, maybe even higher profile players than Robin Leonard, start speaking out about, hey, I've seen this, I've seen that, I've seen I've seen this. You hope that you see a little bit players uh, use the platform that they have to bring more clarity to what's going on, to what goes on behind the scenes, and use that to give themselves to get themselves to get treated better uh, by the team by the teams that they are that employ them. Yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I think. There's a lot of there's a lot of problems with hockey culture, and if the more players that can actually feel empowered to speak up because of a player like Robin Lehner going to bat for a guy that's not even like his teammate anymore, but someone he just played with like what was it four years ago now, five years ago, like that that's kind of what you love you love to see it. Like you want to see a guy 
like Robin Lehner challenging the NHLPA to do something right for a change. Yeah. Because God knows over the playoffs, like the suspensions that were heading into that and that came during it, like there was a lot of critique and finger wagging towards the NHLPA and the Department of Player Safety over what their actual roles are and if they're serving their purposes anymore. And uh, so kudos to him. Uh, obviously the buffalo situation is like just like a complete shit show yeah, we don't even have That's... like it deserves more time than we can give it i'm sure there are sabers podcasts that have given it plenty of time and are talking about it every single day in the way that yeah. we have with Peterson and hughes and their contract yeah, for the last little that, bit does that, that does that really like such small it, it really puts like... it in perspective yeah i was gonna say <laughs> it really is this like those two deals took all, so long all we're worrying about here is imaginary salary cap money and yeah. she's the. And they're the, worrying about their their star number one center, the best player they've had ability in years. To play again, and whether or like, not he will play in the NHL again at this point, because it kind of seems, in yeah. a way, like he, it, in a way, you don't know because it seems mm-hmm. like he will because he's Jack Eichel and he's an amazing player and everybody wants him on their team. But at the same time, the way that they're this is being doled out, it feels like it might you 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 kind of have that worry. Do you, like so? Yeah, yeah like, public gets sorted out. <sighs> It kind of feels, yeah, it feels like the options are like Buffalo finally caves public pressure in the NHLPA threatening action and they just let them do whatever the fuck they want and they, you know, deal with their tail between their legs about trying to prevent him from getting a surgery he thinks he needs. Um, Or Eichel misses out on a full year and like that's not going to look good on them. That's not going to reflect like who was the guy they just drafted? Oh, and Power. Owen Power, like, do you think he sees what's going on with Jack Eichel? And he's like, yeah, Shane I, I can't next wait year. to join this. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're those guys, you're like, I'm holding out. I'm pulling uh, an Eric Lindros and I'm like, don't draft me. Yep. I will not sign with you. I will play in the NCAA for four years and then start my NHL career. Yeah. It takes a lot to get players to not to not want to play for your team in the NHL level. Uh, yeah. This could do it very quickly. This is definitely one of them. Yeah. This is definitely uh, a case where that could very easily sure. happen for them. Um, and that's about it, I think, for this show. I think that's. I think we, so. It's, we've covered it's, all our bases. It's so great. We had a lot of positives to talk about with the the Canucks club. Like, I I was really worried. I mean, I guess it was it really wasn't that worried, but I was kind of like convinced. Like, man, what if these deals are just terrible and like they just like shoot themselves in the foot? But then you see them and you're like, oh, that's pretty reasonable. They're not perfect, right. but they're fine. They're they're manageable. Yeah, they're like, clearly they're manageable. We, yeah. we can deal with this. Yep. You'd like them to go. You'd like them to have gone long, but they didn't. And they're okay. Yeah, they're okay. Right. They're totally okay. That's it. Short term is going to be very interesting. It's going to be it's going to be a fun few years, I think, at least. They were they were contracts that were so okay that they ruined any potential for emergency podcasts, and that's a sure <laughs> sign of a good contract. <laughs> Agreed. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Um, otherwise, folks, thank you for tuning into this very positive uh, episode of the Crease Cast. I, once again, am Cody Sievertson. You can follow me on Twitter at Cody Sievertson. My website is ahlnuxharvest.com. My Instagram is ahlnuxharvest. Lachlan, where can the fine folks find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Lock in the Crease. You can also follow me. Uh, you can also check out my website, lockinthecrease.com, where I recently posted an article more or less going over the same stuff we talked about here about Elias Pettersson, Quinn Hughes' contracts, and the short-term and long-term ramifications of it. And, uh, yeah, I also do the Locked On podcast Monday to Friday with Nick Bondi. Oh, yeah. You can go check that out as well. Uh, and then our new producer who's muted He's in coming the back in. He's uh, – oh, yeah, sorry. i got to press the button. Yeah. <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay. Wait. He's ready to go. Yeah. He's oh. he's unmuted. He doesn't have, he has he's he's on our on our setup oh. so he can This is why I'm not the producer folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob right, tell them where they can there. find you. All right. You can find me on Twitter at JKM new. So that's J K M N E W on Twitter. Hell yeah. Oh yeah. Give him a follow. Give the podcast a follow. Don't forget you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, uh <laughs> Spotify, everywhere, YouTube, one. hit that everywhere. subscribe Every, button. Everywhere you get your podcast, all yep. that crap. Don't forget, check out our YouTube channel. Everything gets posted on video format. Got some pimp-ass graphics, thanks to Lachlan Irvin over there on the booth. Uh, 
what else? Oh, don't forget to subscribe to our Patreon. We have $1 and $5 tiers where we're constantly yes. putting out unique and original content from the host and owner, Lachlan Irvin. And of course, our off the post episodes will be back in full effect soon enough when there is random crap that we can talk about. Uh, until then, folks, we love you so much physically, mentally, emotionally. And we will catch you Friday after a Thursday episode where we get to recap another preseason game. Hopefully, Quinn Hughes, Leas Patterson's preseason debut. If not, we'll catch you. CreaseCast142. Thanks, folks. Bye. Bye. Bye.